Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 8 and 9 this morning. We live in a day where our communication has become increasingly short. We don't write long letters anymore. In fact, well, I can't remember the last time I wrote a long letter. We have taken our communication to a form of short messaging, text messaging. Those of you that participate in Twitter, you have 140 characters to communicate something in Twitter. And we're so used to being able to communicate short, quick bursts of information. And perhaps this is a good point to say, if you're doing that in this next hour or so, it will hopefully be after we've dismissed. Seriously, we use electronic devices in everything. We use it for speaking. We use it for our Bibles. We use it for taking notes. And I trust that the typing that you're doing on your electronic device in this next 45 minutes or so is for the purpose of taking notes and not communicating notes to someone else. But we communicate in short bursts of information. Now, if you were in a situation where you were aware that you needed to communicate to someone that you knew you would never see again, you'd never see them again, and all you had to communicate was something in a written form, uh, what would you communicate? What would you write? You probably wouldn't use Twitter to do it. You would probably use something longer. You might write an extended letter. Even if it wasn't an electronic letter today, you would write an extended letter. And you'd cover important things. You'd cover things in detail. My guess is that as you got to the end of that letter, you would have some short instructions that would say things like, now don't forget, now remember this, keep on doing this, similar to what you do, as you, or if you still do this, perhaps, when you leave the kids with a sitter. If the kids are old enough to understand instructions, you're going to give them a list of things. Now, don't do this and don't do that or that. You're telling it to the sitter. Don't let them get involved in this and make sure they go to bed at this time. And you're giving them short bursts of instructions. And that's really what we see here as we get into this, what we call the letter to the Philippians. We call it the book of Philippians. It's really a letter to the church of Philippi. And thankfully, we have it in the scriptures for us. As we get into what we call the fourth chapter, we get to the part of the letter where the Apostle Paul just lays out very succinctly his final exhortations to what he wants the church at Philippi and wants us to remember. Verse 1, we've already seen the first, I guess, uh, eight verses, seven verses here. Verse 1, he talked about living in spiritual stability. In verses 2 and 3, he wants them to have a harmonious spirit. In verse 4, he talks about having a joyous spirit. In verse 5, a moderate or gracious or reasonable spirit. In verses 6 and 7, uh, really a spirit that's free from worry and how to handle uncertainty. And so this morning, by God's grace, we'll look at the final two exhortations. One is very specific and the other is kind of a concluding general exhortation. So let's let's look at our text this morning. Philippians chapter four. I'll read verses eight and nine. Verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned, and received, and heard, and seen in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. And though we are far removed from this church of Philippi some 2,000 years, we are not far removed from in terms of the need for the same reminders. And so I believe these instructions, these reminders, and basically to have godly thinking and godly actions are very appropriate for us today. And so before we consider the exhortations, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for His help. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for Your Word and the fact that You preserve it for us, that we can study it and we can read it and we can evaluate our lives by it. We thank You for the Holy Spirit within us that uses your word to train us in godliness. And Lord, this morning, I pray that as we consider these two very important exhortations to how we think and how we act, that, Lord, you would do a work in our hearts, do a work that only you can do. Lord, I pray that you would direct my words and thoughts to be exactly what you would have and that your word would have its way in our lives, that it would discern our thoughts and intents of our hearts today as it is promised to do. I pray that our response to that evaluation by your word through your spirit would be honoring to you 
that we would not ignore your word, but that we would follow it. Lord, bless this time together, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to start by considering verse 8, and really the exhortation that Paul gives us there is that we need to maintain a godly thought life. This is not an unfamiliar passage. Many of us have memorized it, either as adults or as children, but I think the appropriate thing to start with is really the essence of what Paul is exhorting us to do. What is he really saying? And what he's really saying is that we need to have the discipline of godly thinking. The discipline of godly thinking. He says, finally, brethren, he gives a bunch of examples, think on these things. Think on. That word means to reckon up all the reasons or to gather, to infer, to consider, to weigh, to meditate on, to evaluate, to calculate. So what would that word look like? Well, perhaps the last time you made a major purchase would be a good example. Uh, perhaps it was the last time I'm thinking a major purchase like a car or a piece of furniture or a new mattress. Buying a new mattress is always fraught with decisions, isn't it? I mean, those big purchases where you just, it wasn't an impulse. I mean, you didn't walk into the store and just buy it, I, I doubt. You spent a good bit of time evaluating, researching who had the best price. What were the qualities that we need? What, what are the features that we need? What can we afford? All those things. That is the idea of this word to evaluate, to consider. So his exhortation is not referring to passing thoughts, but an appropriate understanding would be we need to dwell on or ponder. It refers to what we occupy our minds with, the character of the information that is predominant in our thinking. And notice the way he puts this exhortation. It's not like if you have the chance. Um, when, you, when you have the time, think on these things, it's a command. He says, I want you to be dwelling on, pondering, evaluating, considering specific things. And so this exhortation to proper thinking is not optional. This is something that is applicable to everyone in this room today that is a believer in Jesus Christ. That we have the discipline of godly thinking, that we have control of the things that our minds dwell on. Setting our minds, setting our thoughts on things that have spiritual value. We must exercise this discipline in our, in our thought life to have godly thinking. I think there are a number of areas that we can apply this just even at the beginning. We can apply this exhortation to several different areas. First, this discipline is required to keep our minds from things that are inappropriate. To keep our minds from things that are inappropriate. There are things that as believers should not be part of our thought process. We need to set a watch over our thoughts and really expel those things and seek forgiveness for those things that are inappropriate. Perhaps the classic or or best passage to think about is 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5 that says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Casting down imaginations, that word imaginations is the same, a same word in a different form. It's a noun form of the word to think on. Think on these things. And our instruction here is that we take those things captive. And what are we taking them captive to? We're taking them to the knowledge of God, to the obedience of Christ. You know, the word, world says it's okay to indulge our thinking in all kinds of lustful thoughts, in all kinds of material thoughts. All those things, the world says that's fine. God says, no, it's not. Those are things that for a believer we need to cast aside. And that requires us having a disciplined mind. A mind that doesn't allow wicked thinking to go unchallenged. And you say, well, that's kind of difficult. It is difficult. In fact, if we look at the verses just prior to 2 Corinthians 10.5, verses 3 and 4 say this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, The author, uh, Paul, recognizes that this fight is not a physical fight. It's not a fleshly fight. It's a spiritual fight. And thankfully, we have the Holy Spirit to help us make those decisions and to cast out those thoughts. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to help us, to protect us. What are some examples of thinking that as believers that are inappropriate? What about lustful thinking? We have the privilege today to use something called the Internet. It is a wonderful tool. But with many things, it is a dangerous thing. I'm guessing that we would be shocked if we knew the content 
of what everybody in this room looked at this week on the Internet. There'd be some shocking stuff. I, it would not surprise me at all if there are people in this room this week that spent hours looking at Internet pornography. Wouldn't shock me. That is the kind of thing that we must capture and bring into the obedience of Christ and expel the discipline of godly thinking. That is something that the belief that's inappropriate. Lustful thoughts. Young people, lustful thoughts. Thoughts about the other sex that you do not need to have. Capture them to the obedience of Christ and expel them. What about prideful thoughts? Spiritual pride or personal pride. Those are thoughts that we need to set aside. Vengeful thoughts, things that I'm going to get even with that person. Here's one that we probably fail in a lot. Unbelieving thoughts. Things where we fail to trust God. Those are things we need to cast aside. Selfish thinking, self-centered thinking. All these things are things that are inappropriate in a believer's life. When Paul says, think on these things, have the discipline to ponder the right things, we need to make sure as believers that we are bringing those thoughts into the obedience of Christ. Another area that we must exercise discipline is in this idea of keeping our minds away from things that are just a waste of time. Have you thought about how much time we waste in our thinking, we ponder things? Concern over things that are outside our control. We talked about this just last week in verse 6 and 7. What does it say? Worry about everything. Make sure that you've got a contingency plan for every aspect of your life. That's what verse 6 says, right? No. It says the exact opposite. Be careful. Be anxious. Worry about just the big things. No. Nothing. And so we could say that disciplining our minds, having, the, having our minds disciplined to godly thinking would say, not that I'm not worried about anything, but I am not going to get anxious. It doesn't mean we don't plan, that we don't lay things out, but it does mean that we don't spend our time thinking about things that are a waste of time. Okay? We're instructed not to be anxious. What about concern over material provision? Matthew chapter 6, if we had time, we'd turn there. But we understand that God provides for us. He cares for the smallest animals. When you see a bird outside your window in the feeder, you realize God cares for that sparrow. And I am much more valuable than that sparrow. And God cares for me. And so worrying about our, our shelter, our food, it's a waste of time. It's not godly thinking. Another area that's a waste of time is what others think of us. Matthew chapter 10. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. We get caught up in the fear of man. The opinion of men becomes more important than the fear of God. Sometimes we call that peer pressure. We really could call it disobedience because God says, listen, don't worry about what men think. If you're honoring me and you're obeying my word, that's what we need to be concerned about. And so we need to make sure we're disciplining our minds not to focus on things that are unproductive or just a waste of time. And so we must have really the essence of what Paul is saying here is that we need to have our minds disciplined to godly thinking. Now, Paul doesn't really give us an exact reason why this is important, but I think as we look at the rest of Scripture, uh, there are several things that are be important to consider, and I've been t- titled those the spiritual significance of godly thinking. What are, why is it spiritually significant to make sure that we have godly discipline in our thinking? Well, first, wickedness that defiles us comes from within us. This is exactly what Christ taught in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, if you want to turn there, Matthew 7, verses 20 to 23, I'll read those for you. And Jesus is speaking here, and he said, That which cometh out of the man, that it is that which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. And obviously the context is, the Pharisees were thinking that external, external purity was a means to holiness. He, they were questioning Christ or the fact that the disciples hadn't washed their hands properly or gone through the ceremonial washing before they ate. And Christ said, listen, it's not what you bring into your body that defiles you. It's the wickedness that's within. And so this discipline over our thought life is very significant. It's very significant to our spiritual well-being. We have to have a guard on the inside for spiritual failure. In other words, we must be on our guard. Often we approach our spiritual life just as the Pharisees. We try to make the outside look 
as good as we can. And no one can see what's going on up here. The fact that our thought life is totally wicked. And yet Christ's challenge was, it's from within that we must be most careful. So the spiritual significance of our godly thinking is that we are defiled from the inside out. Also, another significant thing is that wicked actions start as wicked thinking. And we saw this just last Sunday night from James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James lays out this four-step process of our thinking that turns goes from wicked thinking to wicked action and ultimately to death. A desire, we're drawn away of our own lust. A desire starts in the mind. We give assent to it in our mind. And then it's conceived. It, it becomes a plan. And we contemplate it further. And then it bringeth forth sin. It's birthed into action. And ultimately, it brings forth death. For those that don't accept Christ, it is eternal death. For those that are in Christ, it is loss of fellowship. Not loss of relationship, but loss of fellowship. So that process of going from desire to birth to action sometimes takes split seconds. Your doctor has put you on a health plan that's very important for you. You have a very restricted diet. And you walk by the kitchen at work. And what's laying there? A big old bear claw, right? You know the ones. They're about that big, right? They look so good. And in an instantaneous second, you go from thought to action. That may be a silly example, but you can see that how the process of sin starts in our minds. Sometimes it takes a period of years for it to bear fruit, to bring forth death. You start entertaining wrong thoughts about another person another person at your workplace, and that person starts talking to you, and you start going, wow, that person's more interested to me, in me than my spouse is. You start going to lunch together. You start spending more time together. Over the period of time, what started just as a thought ends up in a wicked act. And so the spiritual significance of disciplining our mind is that wickedness starts in our mind. Wicked action begins in our mind. And so that is why it is so important that we exercise this discipline. Now, Paul gives us the content of our godly thinking. He gives us six or eight things here that really should represent what we are thinking about. What should it look like? And let's run through these, each one of these, very quickly so that we have an understanding of it. He says, first of all, we are to consider our, our minds are to evaluate, be pondering, to be spending time on a category of content that is defined as true. True, that which is truthful, that that which represents things as they really are. Not as we perceive them, not as how we think they are, but what is true. God is the source of all truth, and therefore whatever he thinks is right, is right. It doesn't matter what you think is right. It doesn't matter what you think reality is. If it does not conform to truth, if it does not conform to God's reality, it's not real. And so God is the source of all truth. And so we need to make sure that our thinking is centered on that which is true, that which is real, that is which is reality in every situation. If God calls something sin, then it is sin. And that needs to be our manner of thinking. We need to have that framework, that category of thinking. Notice the next one, honest. Honest. And this word could really, the word in the original means that which is worthy of honor, that which has uh, worthy of reputation, that which is noble, uh, dignified, worthy of respect. And this helps us to put a category of things where the disgusting, sinful things of the world are not honorable. And we put those aside. Put the context of perhaps the television viewing or the video game playing or the other entertainment that you participated in this week? Is it honorable? Is it venerable? Is it worthy of respect? See, that, this is where it's very, very practical in our daily lives, in our daily walk. Everything that we do should be going through this filter. Notice third, it's just. A third category of regulating our thinking is just. Uh, the word most of the time is translated righteous. Right or righteous And so, again, this is very similar to the idea of pondering that which is true because that which is right and that which is righteous is going to be in perfect harmony with God and perfect harmony with his word. 
And so we know from his word the things that are right. The fourth category is pure, free from carnality, free from uh, that which is modest, that which is chaste, immaculate, clean, and holy. The next category, lovely, that which is pleasing, sweet, gracious, generous, patient. The sixth category, good report, that which has a good reputation, that which is attractive, that literally rings true to the highest standard. And then he puts kind of a a wrapper around the last two. He says that which is, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, if there's moral excellence and it's praiseworthy. These are the things that need to be the boundaries for that which we think about. As we discipline our minds to think on these things, this, these eight things are the categories of things which we should be thinking and how we should be thinking. All that we do, all that we're pouring into our mind, and we live in a day where we are very uh, media rich. We all, most many of us, have devices with us that provide us content. It, uh, YouTube still amazes me. That there is, if you want to learn how to do something, there's a training video that someone put up there to help you learn how to do that. And that's unheard of. You know, 20 years ago, you never would have thought that I could watch a video about how I install a piece of software or how I install a new piece of computer hardware or how I bake a cake. You find a new recipe on the Internet. So how do I do that? You go to YouTube and they can show you how to bake it, cook it, make it. So we live in a very media-rich age. And so it's ever more important that as believers that we are disciplining our minds and using these criteria to filter the things we're watching. That goes everything from the video games you play to the Internet sites you visit to the stuff on your DVR to the DVDs that you rent. I guess we don't really rent DVDs anymore, do we? We just stream them probably. When you see Blockbuster closing, you know we don't rent DVDs anymore. We just stream the content. And so, as a believer, it is critically important. Because what is filthy comes from within us, and what starts in our mind ends up in an action. And so, having these categories are extremely important. Let me ask the question, how would you characterize your thought life? Does it meet the criteria that Paul challenges us with? What about the things that you're letting into your mind? You know, we do a lot of reading today, too. Uh, The availability of books today is, again, unprecedented. Literally, uh, I find a book I want, and in seconds, I've got it. It's wonderful, especially for studying God's Word. I find a commentary I need, and within seconds, it's on my pad, or it's on my computer, or it's both. But what are we pouring into our mind with reading? Does it meet the criteria the Apostle Paul lays out? Are we careful about what our eyes and minds dwell on? Are our minds full of thoughts, of bitterness? That's not in the list. We need to be extremely careful, extremely disciplined. The solution is we found, we looked at the solution in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. We capture those thoughts that don't meet the criteria and we expel them. We bring them to the obedience of Christ. And thankfully, we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to help us with that. Boy, if you fit in the criteria today of the Internet content I talked about earlier, get that right. Get it right. Bring that into the obedience of Christ. Think on these things. So the content of our thought as believers need to be that which reflects the nature and character of God. Notice that each one of these items that the Apostle Paul lays out for us is just like our God. He's true. He's honest. He's just. He's lovely. He's of the highest standard. He's excellent. And he's worthy of our praise. And so our thinking needs to reflect the God we serve. And so it's an exhortation for us, essentially, to live like Christ on the inside, between our ears, and thinking as God would have us think. Now, Paul's final exhortation is we find in verse 9, because in verse 10 he goes on to another matter, a real personal discussion of how the Philippians have met his needs, and we'll see that in in the weeks to come. But we notice in verse 9, his exhortation is to live in obedience. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So after giving us six very specific exhortations, here he gets very general and just exhorts us, exhorts them and us, to a life of obedience. 
And we need that reminder. I think the amazing part is how the Apostle Paul starts again, and that is in his personal example of obedience. He says, those things you've learned, received, heard, and seen in me, do them. And once again, Paul is laying out his own life as an example for them to follow. We've seen that in previous weeks. The idea of the word seen there is to see with the eyes, to perceive with the mind, to become acquainted with, by experience. So Paul is appealing to his first-hand experience, the time he spent in Philippi. They were able to see his life uh, and, and laid out before them. It tells us a number of things about Paul. First of all, it tells them that he understood for te- the need for teaching by example. He understood it was impossible to teach everything only by words or only in writing, that there were some things he had to show, even about the Christian life. And sometimes the ones we teach are just not able to grasp the lesson, they have not been through the difficulties we've been through. And they, they can hear you talk about making it through a trial, and yet they've never been through it. And so Paul used his own example. Sometimes the maturity level, the people you're trying to teach, they just can't grasp the concept. If you've got teenagers, sometimes trying to teach teenagers the realities of adult life, they just don't get it. They don't understand the pressure of a mortgage. They don't understand the pressure of a work schedule. And so you have to demonstrate how to handle that in a godly manner by your example. Paul also, we know from his statement that he was confident in his consistency. In other words, he was living what he had taught. You know, it's it's very obvious that it's possible for us to teach a truth and never put it into practice. Probably the best example I think of is the parents screaming at their kid to stop screaming at their brother. Stop screaming at your brother! Oh, yes, okay. Um, How do you think they figured out how to scream at their brother? Oh, it's because their sister was doing it. That's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is. No, they follow your example. And so Paul was able to say, look at my life, because what I'm teaching and what I'm doing are consistent. It also tells us that he was confident in his own obedience. He, He was living what he knew. I mean, think of where Paul was. He had the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures to follow. But the instruction of the New Testament, well, he was writing it still. And so as he interacted with God, as God taught him things, he was living what he knew to live and what he knew was right. And so although it's not expressly stated here, I think it's appropriate for us to take the opportunity to evaluate our own obedience and really our own example. Are you using your life to teach? What can only be taught by example? What kind of an example are you? Are you displaying the proper walk with Christ? What about to your children? Do your children see a consistency? Well, Dad says we can't watch this, but when I leave the room, he watches that. Now, there may be news stories and news shows that are for someone that has a more mature mind. But the kids need to understand that. They need to understand that. But can your kids see a consistency? Are you telling them to do one thing and with your life, totally different? Kids, it's important that we put God's truth as a priority, but they never see you in God's truth. Or when it comes time to come back for the service tonight to be a part of our study in James, well, there's a football game on, guys, that I just got to see. What does that communicate? You can say, well, going to church and being in the Word and being around God's people and participating in Bible study It's so important, but it's not as important as a football game that you can DVR, by the way, and watch later. What about to your spouse? You know, your spouse probably knows you better than anyone. Are you being consistent in front of that person? Are you being an example of godliness to them? Wives, are you being a godly example of to your husband? So I thought that was supposed to be the other way around. No, wives can be an example, too. There are things that we can, guys, we can learn from our wives and vice versa. Ladies, there's things you can learn from your husbands. What about to coworkers? Are you demonstrating a proper life to your coworkers? You say, oh, my coworkers are lost. What better example to demonstrate godly living than those that are lost? Classmates, students that are here. Are you an example of obedience in class? You say, well, that's not cool. That's totally not cool. In fact, I'd get ridiculed for it. Then be ridiculed for it. If we're going to get ridiculed for doing right, so be it. So students, whether you're a college or a high school student in here, obey. Be an example in your obedience. 
Are you living what you know to do? You know, we, we do not live in an age where we, we haven't been taught. We've been taught a lot. In fact, you've probably heard messages from this passage. You say, yeah, they're a lot better. That was funny, okay? You all can laugh. All right. Maybe it wasn't funny. Um, but we're not without obedient, uh, abundant teaching. We have been taught. We have books, abundant books to read. We have commentaries to read. We have uh, study guides to read. Are we doing what we know to do? Are we doing what we've been taught? Are we being, are we being obedient in that manner? Are you consistent in what you require of others? Paul, Paul's ability to really make his own obedience a standard is really remarkable. And we should seek to have that kind of consistency where we can demonstrate the example of obedience. There are several things I think as Paul, Paul lays out this exhortation that demonstrate really the problems uh, that we have with our obedience. I think from the beginning of our lives, we struggle with our obedience. I think we all think, you know, someday, as a teenager, you think, someday I'm going to be out from under Dad and I'm in charge. Yeah, that's going to be great. And then you get to that point and you realize that you still have a boss that's in charge. You're know, like, ooh, this is kind of like being under Dad. And you go, well, I'm just going to start my own business and I'm going to be my own man. And then you've got customers that are in charge. And we all have the Lord over us. And yet we all struggle. We all struggle with obedience to authority. And so Paul, it's interesting how he kind of deals with those issues in his, how he writes this. We often apply selective obedience. And, and so you see him writing those things which you have learned, received and heard. In addition to what you've seen, he's very thorough in his description of their obedience the things that you have learned. That would actually be, the word there is a word that's used uh, in other parts of the Scripture to describe the discipleship relationship. That discipling, the instruction, that even one-on-one instruction that I've trained you in. So they have to obey that. The things that have been received. Many times that word is used to refer to the written revelation of Scripture. Those things that Paul had either written to them uh, likely writing to them, clearly they've got the, this letter that he's writing, and the things that they have heard. So the, the communication, the oral communication that Paul had given. He, he wants them to be completely thorough, whether it's in writing, whether it was uh, orally transmitted, uh, whether the things that they've seen in him, all these things are things that need to be uh, obeyed, that need to be followed. And, and the problem with us is we tend to pick and choose. You know, if it's easy to do, I'll do it. If it's hard to do, I'm not. And we need not be selective in our obedience because obedience, again, is not defined by the servant. It's defined by the master. What does God want? That is what we must obey. So let me ask you this question. Where do you stand in this matter of thorough obedience? Are you following all you know to do? Or are you filtering the instructions and saying, you know what, this part of my life right now, I just want to go this way. And I really don't care what God says. I know perhaps that he says I shouldn't be doing that, but I really don't care. I know my parents I have this instruction for me, but I don't care. See, we're selective in our obedience. And that is not what Paul wanted. That's not what God wants. He wants us to be thorough. And then notice also we're often inconsistent in our obedience. The idea there at the end of the word verse, he says those things you've heard, you've learned, received, heard and seen, do them. So that's kind of a simple word, yes, but it's an interesting word. It means to practice, to be busy with, to carry on. It's a word that we could use of a lawyer who does law or practices law or a doctor that practices medicine. That doesn't mean he's experimenting with you, but sometimes it feels like that. But that means he has a routine, something that he is carrying out, a discipline that he is performing. And so the idea here gives us the idea of our obedience is not something that's hit or miss. It's not one day I'm not obedient, the next day I am. It is a consistency, something that we're continually progressing in. And so it's a habit that we are continuously practicing. And so not only must we not be selective, but we must not be inconsistent in our obedience. And then Paul concludes really really with a wonderful promise, the promise of our obedience. And he says, and the God of peace, the God of peace will be with you. And I think we see two very, very important truths here. First of all, that God's presence is predicated upon our practice. God's presence is predicated on our practice. In other words, if we are being obedient, God is with us. John says that in 
Christ said this in John 14. Jesus answered and said unto them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him, make our dwelling place with him. We see a similar truth in 1 John chapter 1, where it says if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we will have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, as we are walking with the light, we are, as we are being obedient, we are walking in the light and we have fellowship with God. The previous verse, 1 John 1, 6, says if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. And so if we are obedient to God, we have the precious promise of his presence and with his presence is promised peace. We see that in verse 7, the peace that surpasses any understanding that we can have. And so that is a great truth. I trust that as we consider these two exhortations today, that you will not leave here and go, that was nice. We spent our time in church. We sang about grace. We studied Philippians 4 but that you will apply it personally. Is there something about Paul's exhortation to the Philippians and to us in your thinking that needs to change, that needs to change today? Your thoughts, the things that you are dwelling on are not consistent with true, honest, just, pure, lovely, reputable, praiseworthy, morally virtuous. That's a big list. What about your obedience? Is it consistent? Is it thorough? Is it such that it can be an example to others, not out of pride, but showing others how to walk? That's the exhortation we have. If there is an issue that God has pointed out to you today, the proper response, say, God, I submit. God, I need to change. It may even mean, God, I need some help from another mature believer My thinking is so off track that I need to seek counsel. I will humble myself and go get some help. I trust that you will do that today. Let's close in a word of prayer.